you, Cutter. I was striking for gunner's mate at the time, and later, uh, after, went back to sea on another ship, the destroyer escort. I made chief oh, gunner. Well, that's mate. what my dad served aboard. Mm-hmm. All right, so destroyer escort. Yes, indeed. Which one? The uh, DE-150, the USS Nunzer, or, or, uh, launched in Orange, Texas in 43. Yeah, well, I was on the, on the 252, Howard Crow. For and, heaven's sake! <laughs> yeah. And if people are not aware of uh, the designation destroyer escort, it was a miniature destroyer that uh, rocked and rolled quite a lot, did it oh, not? Oh, sharp. She stick it, stick it in your foot. Really, the bow was sharp. <laughs> oh the yeah, no, no, no. The, the, the sailors aboard said they should get both flight pay and submarine pay because they spend half the time in the air and half the time underwater. Exactly. <laughs> our guest, Richard Snow, author of A Measureless Peril, also in the studio, uh, our, a dear friend and uh, a quite, fr- quite frankly, a, a great treasure. And uh, I say that to his face and publicly, Hugh Salter. You're listening to Viewpoints here on the Talk Station FM 107 AM 12. We're talking about, well, that portion of the war, but the entire war that so few people think anything about. And when we come back, I want to talk about what it was, the psychological experience of those long periods of boredom punctuated by moments of sheer crisis and fear. You're listening to Viewpoints here on the talk station, FM 107, AM 1240. few points here on the talk station, FM 107, AM 1240. Um, you hear this from Rush all the time, having more fun than a human being should be allowed to do. I am this afternoon. Not only am I having fun, I'm greatly honored. Having here in the studio a, a personal friend, uh, quite frankly, a mentor. I've known him uh, well all my life. Uh, we know him here in the county as Marshall. Hugh, Hugh Salter, former uh, county sheriff, but more importantly, a former federal marshal serving under three presidents. And more important than even that, the contribution he's provided this country in his service with the United States Coast Guard during World War II. Uh, As we heard a few moments ago, the Coast Guard cutter Alexander Hamilton, in which he served, and uh, we'll hear a few minutes about the experience he had, uh, having been torpedoed. But once he served, he was then serving under the Navy, because in times of war, the Department of Defense takes control of the uh, Coast Guard, you normally providing uh, providing this service to the Navy, and uh, also joining us, the author of A Measureless Peril, America in the Fight for the Atlantic, the Longest Battle of World War II. Very quickly, uh, Richard Snow is the guest and author of that book. I'm, I enjoy, asked him to join us this afternoon after hearing his interview earlier uh, with uh, Ben Ball two, a week ago. And uh, when I heard the interview, I said, oh, he's got to be in here and meet Hugh Salter uh, someone I'm confident he would be he's pleased to know is is with us and is willing to share time and experience with us and uh, Richard uh, very quickly before we go to Hugh it is interesting uh, the subject of the of the uh, Lend Lease program uh, the stories of all the escort services and the if I'm not mistaken thousands of ships that were sunk in service initially for the European allies and then of course throughout the course of the war a lot of people don't think of that as really a key portion of World War II. Yet it was, was it not? Well, yes. I think um, certainly um, certainly the Germans thought of it as the Absolutely. key portion of World War II, and their their goal throughout the war uh, was to to strangle Britain by keeping, and then later the European fighting fronts by keeping those supplies from getting through. And they came awfully close, close. to doing it. Yet there was one thing standing in the way. Hugh Salter and and many others just like him. And I say that not to be smiling because, let's talk about this, Hugh. You served, you were a striking for a gunner's mate. By the way, if those who do not know what striking means, he was actually working to become a gunner's mate. Mm -hmm. And um, Hugh, where were you, uh, I mean, you were serving aboard the the, uh, Alexander Hamilton. The announcement that you were going to be providing escort duty for uh, at that time, originally, if I'm not mistaken, it was probably just commercial ships before we actually engaged in the construction of Liberty ships, and we'll get to that in a moment. What was the attitude aboard the ship that you recall? Was it just uh, you, you, it, because at that point, did you were you aware of the of the uh, the threat that re- existed when it, when you when it was first announced? Oh yeah, the, we we became aware of that. Of course, when the when the president announced the, the 
far it will. And you know when you in 19, see it. And this is in 1940, before the before the Declaration 40, of War. 41, yeah, 40, 41, somewhere in that area. And, okay, before the before the actual before declaration. the actual Declaration of War, yeah. So it it was clear from command, we were unofficially at war. We'd that's taken over correct. Iceland. That's correct, and uh, we were we we had to camouflage the ship. We mixed all the paint together, and of mm-hmm. course, it all turned out to be black. <laughs> and, uh, but we painted it anyway, and uh, at at sea. Wow. It's, well, in the process, let's talk about the experiences that you had, Hugh, uh, as you were obviously eyeing the the ocean for uh, U-boats. Of course. Richard, very quickly, uh, as you point out in your book, the U-boats were really not designed to spend a long time underwater because they uh, ran on batteries, very tight quarters. By the way, uh, a great book. Uh, Just listening to the story about what it was like to live aboard those U-boats, that took courage. Um, But these vessels would only, uh, normally would only uh, surface at nighttime. They would stay under and they would prowl the oceans. Um, in the process, how did they find their their targets? Do were they did they were they? T- they they, um, they uh, were. Uh, it's interesting. They they you think of you you know you see the movies where there's the periscope and right. it's coming up. They usually uh, only attack underwater during the day or in very crowded circumstances. They would go in. There the technique. They were really, uh, they acted when they could like surface raiders. They'd mm-hmm. go in very fast because they could run on the surface at 17 knots and underwater on their electric motors, which they had to use when they were submerged, only about six. So they would go in in the dark. They'd fire off torpedoes. Uh, uh, they, they found their targets both through their own uh, extremely, extremely all too effective intelligence service, but also from uh, just simple hour after hour after boring hour of four guys standing shoulder to shoulder on the uh, deck of the ship, scanning the horizon with binoculars, looking for a wisp of smoke. All right, with that said, um, now turning to you, Hugh, what was it like looking for those? Because you were running escort duty, so you were, your job was to search out for those U-boats. Is that correct? Yeah, we kept kept uh, uh, bought binoculars, and, mm-hmm. and uh, we'd scan the the whole horizon. ocean area, looking for the, the the Germans. They run in packs, you know. There were several of them together within the same area. Would they uh, give off any kind of telltale smoke from their engines? Obviously, they had diesel engines. Well, uh, at, at night, they, they, when, they, when they came up, they would they would be as far away as, as they could get, you know. Okay. And when they're submerged, that's when they moved in next to you, see. How often did you yourself see any U-boats in your experience aboard the Alexander Hamilton? Well, I, I never did spot one, really. But, uh, Almost no one they, did. They were very, they, very hard to spot. They were sharp. And, yeah. they, and they take and they're very small, very, very small uh, profile in the water. Right. And it's a big ocean. Now, you don't realize until you start looking for something mm-hmm. of that nature how big it is and how hard it is to find it. Hugh, in your experience, let's talk about um, uh, your experience with the U-boats. Obviously, uh, did you have depth charges? How were you at that point? Had had the uh, uh, hogsheads, as I think they were called, uh, were hedgehogs. They hedgehogs, hedgehogs. How, did they did they exist at that point? Well, they they come on a little bit later, but uh, we had the depth charges. We had uh, three uh, inch, five inch uh, barrel guns, mm-hmm. and three inch fifties, and of course all of the small arms, the twenty millimeter, forty millimeter, that type stuff. So, all of that. so when you did uh, in the engagements with the um, the U boats that you experienced, were they all the U boats underwater at that point? At that when you were actually en- got engaged with them? Well, we, we, the only engagement that we got was when we received that torpedo. We'd been we, we, okay. We had been towing a ship uh, that was dead in the water. A, a big. Uh, refrigerator ship went completely dead. We towed it for six days and nights prior to the time that we got hit. And while we were staying, changing over from from our ship to a small tug to tow it on into Iceland, when we cranked up to 15 knots, that's when they threw the torpedo at us and at the Vulcan also, and they missed the Vulcan and hit us. Wow. What happened? So we uh, 